What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of No Mercy with yours truly, Stephen A. Smith, coming at you as I love to do several times uh, during the week. Right now, I'm coming at you and I'm here in the studio thanks to our official studio sponsor, FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel is the official sports betting company of the No Mercy podcast. You know, again, this is not a sports podcast, but I love, there's no but, I actually love talking about a plethora of things. More importantly, whatever matters. Keep in mind that I have a news background. Been a journalist for over 25 years. Yeah, I'm a personality and all of this other stuff, but the bottom line is, is that when questions need to be asked, when issues need to be addressed, that's what I try to bring to the table. And I'm unapologetic about that. And I don't like restricting myself to the world of sports when there's other things that's coming on. I love sports. I love talking about it. We'll always love talking about it. We'll continue to do it. But there are moments where you deviate from it because it's necessary. And this subject that I'm about to bring up is necessary. This past February 3rd, a derailment took place. One that's been classified as a very toxic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, where we're talking about that toxic derailment has contaminated, and I'm just reading from reports here, it's contaminated at least 15,000 pounds of soil and 1.1 million gallons of water so far. This is according to the reports. Over 5,000 residents had to be evacuated. Obviously, it was a 151-car train that derailed on February 3rd, forcing that evacuation. And ever since then, it's been absolute mayhem. We've had politicians on both sides of the aisle going crazy, going off. Um, we've got a, a senator in Marco Rubio who's called for Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg to be fired. We've had another senator, both Republicans, Eric Schmidt of Missouri, uh, saying this past weekend that Buttigieg has been an absolute no-show. Um, you've got people looking at the transportation secretary who, according to reports, has yet to visit the toxic rail wreck in East Palestine, Ohio, saying, quote, he's waiting for the right time, end quote. And so as a result of that, that requires a lot of questions, a lot of attention. It's one of the scariest things that you could really, really have to deal with if you're a citizen from anywhere, but particularly in something, in a place rather, that's supposed to be uh, recognized as the greatest place on the planet Earth. Richest country on the Earth. Obviously, we have luxuries and amenities that most nations do not have at their disposal. And when these kind of things happen, because accidents do happen, you ultimately have to look at everything. You have to look at the participation and the activity on the part of the politicians. You have to look at our government to see what they're doing to assess and ultimately eradicate the situation that's been pervasive and bad for American citizens. You got to do all of those things. I don't know the answer to these questions. I'm not a government official. I'm certainly not a chemical expert. I'm certainly not somebody that's a transportation expert that can answer questions as to how all of this has happened and what exactly is being done about it. I do know this. It's pretty hard to focus on games and sports when stuff like this is happening. I can tell you that. And I can tell you that it calls for a time where it's necessary to ask questions, just explanations, not to interrogate, but to ask questions, to highlight the kind of things that have been transpiring and to see what our elected officials have to say about it. And not elected officials, but people who work for our elected officials, see what they have to say about it. In this case, it would be Pete Buttigieg, the transportation secretary for the United States of America. Trains, planes, automobiles, and everything else in between. This is what this man is involved in. This is what comes along with his job description. This is what he was given a $1.2 trillion bipartisan budget based on a bipartisan law that they passed. This is what he's had at his disposal to help alleviate a lot of the concerns that American citizens are having. So who better to talk to than the man himself? Pete Buttigieg. Transportation Secretary of the United States of America. He's up next on No Mercy with yours truly. Don't touch that dial. 
You want to know what you can do with Room? You can shop thousands of cars right from your phone and have your next ride delivered straight to you. I've had trouble shopping for cars in the past for a number of reasons, like too few cars available where I'm looking. How about that one? Or a lack of good, reliable information. How about that one? Or not enough time in the day for me to drive down to a dealership and check out what they have. How about that reasoning? And that's why Vroom is the better way to buy your next ride because you can browse thousands of cars from the comfort of your home without haggling or negotiating the price, of course. You can also trade in your old car once you buy a new one or even sell your car to Vroom and get a price instantly. That's peace of mind, y'all, and convenience we never used to have while buying a car. Plus, they'll give you a full week or 250 miles, whichever comes first, with a vehicle to make sure your new ride is right for you. And all cars come with a 90-day limited warranty and a year of roadside assistance. You can buy a car from Vroom entirely online. So next time you need to buy a car, just grab your phone. Go to Vroom.com and check out thousands. I said thousands of cars. Check it out. What's better than finding quality candidates? How about this question? Finding them instantly. How about that? For a powerful hiring partner, you know what you need? You need Indeed. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites. That's a losing strategy. They ain't going to work. Instead, attract, interview, and hire all on Indeed and find top talent fast with tools like Instant Match. As soon as you sponsor a post, you'll get a short list of quality candidates who you can invite to apply right away. I'm a competitive guy, in case you didn't know. And this is the competitive advantage you need. I'm not sitting around for candidates to come to me. I'm bringing my business to them. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent. Fast. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash mercy to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash mercy. Indeed.com slash mercy. Terms and conditions apply. Course where application price is not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Please welcome to No Mercy, Mr. Secretary himself, Pete Buttigieg. How are you, sir? How's everything going, sir? Mr. Secretary, how's everything? I'm good. We're hard at work. Thanks for having me on. Listen, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Let's get right to it. I mean, for those who may not know, listen, when we talk about the Secretary of Transportation, I think the first order of business, sir, is to define for people what the job description entails. There's so many people out there that think they know. But when you say Secretary for Transportation for the United States of America, could you outline for my listeners and viewers exactly your job title, what it entails, sir? Sure. Uh, uh, it is a lot. It's every form of transportation uh, uh, pretty much in, in the country from commercial space travel to, uh, uh, to uh, roads and highways. So the way I think about it is there's, there's three parts to this job. Uh, the first is to protect everybody who comes into contact with our transportation system. And we do that uh, with everything from safety regulations, which are on our mind, especially this week with everything that uh, folks in East Palestine, Ohio, are going through after that uh, train derailed there and, and released toxic materials, uh, to uh, work that we do to make sure that uh, our roads and our streets get safer, or to protect airline passengers, uh, to make sure that uh, airlines treat them right. Uh, a second set of things that we do is we build things. Uh, under the president's infrastructure law, uh, we're uh, putting forward the, the basically the biggest infrastructure investment in the better part of a century to do everything from fixing airports to replacing bridges to improving the ports that move our goods in and get our supply chains running so that we have the right kind of transportation infrastructure for the country. And then the third is uh, uh, a lot of uh, parts of our transportation system uh, that we operate ourselves as an agency. For example, the air traffic control system uh, as part of the FAA. Uh, one of the things that we oversee to make sure that uh, airline passengers are safe and to keep up the record of aviation safety. So it's, it, it's something new and different every day. It's, uh, uh, it's an exciting time for transportation, but also facing a lot of major challenges and, uh, and issues, problems that have confronted the transportation system that you might feel, uh, whether, uh, again, you're in a community like uh, in Ohio that's dealing with this derailment, or whether mm -hmm. you're an airline passenger, uh, or whether you're uh, noticing that a bridge in your town is uh, being uh, put on a load limit and you've got uh, uh, to drive around it because of the condition it's in. 
all of those are things that we work on here at the Department of Transportation. You know, right now you're going through a lot as an administration. There's no doubt about that. A lot of as, as a department. When you're talking about the derailment that took place on February 3rd in East Palestine, Ohio, like you pointed out, it called for the evacuation of roughly 5,000 uh, residents. We all understand that. Obviously, people have been complaining about the, the quality of air, water. People have been reportedly sick and things of that nature. And you've had individuals on both sides of the aisle really, really speaking out against your department, in all honesty. Um, how do you respond to all of that at this particular moment in time in light of what has transpired? What I'm trying to do is cut through the noise, cut through the mis misinformation, get to the reality and get to the facts. Uh, our focus is on making sure that residents in this community are taken care of and making sure the trains get safer in this country. Uh, look, the last administration dismantled a lot of rail safety regulations. I think now is a time, and you know we've been working on that uh, for, for two years since I got here, but especially now, now is the time we can raise the bar on what we demand that railroad companies do in terms of how they treat people, how they treat their own workers, uh, how they treat the communities that they're moving cargo through, especially when it is uh, hazardous cargo. So I've put forward a set of things that, uh, that, that we're doing, everything from making sure there are actual minimum standards on how many crew members can be on a train, uh, to making sure that we have uh, focused inspections where we're uh, making sure there's the, the uh, quality of, uh, of safety procedures out there, but also things the railroads need to do to change because they have been fighting uh, safety regulations tooth and nail and things we'd like Congress to do. Believe it or not, some of the same members of Congress who have tried to uh, use this as an excuse to uh, attack the administration politically are the ones who usually take the side of the railroad industry uh, when uh, we're having a struggle to, to try to get a safety regulation through or uh, try to get them to treat people better. So I think now's the time to, to just push past the politics, focus on what's going to make people better off, both specifically in Ohio where this community, you know, they did nothing wrong. They did not deserve uh, to have their lives upended like this. Uh, so focusing on supporting everybody from them to anybody who lives anywhere near a rail line in the country, which is uh, a lot of us. Well, when you talk about the previous administration and how they basically disbanded some of the regulations uh, and they certainly didn't pay as rapt attention to it as they should have. Can you speak specifically to what wasn't done that's being done now for those that may not understand? Yeah, I'll give you a good example. Uh, right now, believe it or not, the railroad industry has been pushing to be allowed to have only one person on a train. And we all know how long freight trains can get. I mean, they're getting a mile or more. Uh, so there is a process to uh, require that there be at least two people on these trains. Last administration froze that process. As soon as I got here, we started uh, uh, re restoring that process so we can set a rule and enforce it uh, for safety reasons. Uh, they used to do uh, a lot of audits. Uh, those safety audits slowed down or stopped under the last administration. We brought mm -hmm. them back. And we think we can do more. We, we think we can do things like uh, require that uh, stronger tank cars, these are the cars that you see going by, uh, sometimes with, with uh, liquid or hazardous material in them, uh, that we speed up the timeline that they're required uh, to get those uh, uh, get those new stronger take tank cars in that are going to be more likely to resist a, a crash. So those are some examples of some of the things that we're focused on as a department. Some of them we need help from Congress. Some of them we're doing on our own. And we also need the, the railroad companies to change. Uh, but we're not going to wait for them to do it out of the goodness of their heart. There, there have to be some... Uh, uh, real rules of the road here. As a layman, just curious from this perspective, and I certainly don't have any expertise in this category, so I'm not trying to, I'm just asking questions because I want you to, to be yeah. able to disseminate a message to our listeners and viewers. Not that I know, because I'm far from an expert on this, but I got to ask you, when you yeah. talk about cutting through just the noise and the rhetoric, obviously from both sides of the aisle in this particular situation, because everybody wants to come across as the hero and make sure that they're mm -hmm. blameless in all of this and they're going to point it in a direction. I'm trying to figure out how on earth are you going to be able to pull something like that off when we've just had midterm elections, when there's obviously people that's vying for the presidency. Nikki Haley have already, has already announced that she's going to be running for president. We know Trump is going to do so. DeSantis is expected to do so. Biden probably will will run again. That's your boss and what have you. When all the politics that obviously religiously exist, along mm -hmm. with the fact that it's not expected to go anywhere, this is a special time. That it, this is when mm -hmm. stuff, stuff is politicized more than ever before. How are you going to cut through all of that as the transportation secretary, knowing that stuff is going to be politicized at every turn? 
Well, here's the good thing about transportation. Uh, you, you're, you're right. I mean, there, there's no, uh, nobody's immune from, uh, from politics, especially in terms of the, the way things work here in Washington. But more than most issues, I found transportation is actually an issue you can get people to work together across the aisle on. And mm. I'll give you a good example. Uh, the, the infrastructure package that, uh, that we're using right now to fix ports and, and replace bridges and fix highways and uh, get improvements in airports around the country. That actually got passed with a lot of Republicans crossing over to work with Democrats on this. You don't see a lot of that in Washington, especially mm. right now in Washington. But it was a big push for the president. He wanted this to be bipartisan. And what I found is, you know, it doesn't matter if you're left, right, or center. Uh, most people get why you need uh, highway improvements in your community. Most people get why uh, you need safer uh, uh, sidewalks so people can walk to school and, 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 and work. Uh, most people get why we need to improve our airports in a country if, if you spend any time in our airports. And so what I found is, look, the, the, the political noise is always going to be there. But when we have something specific that we know that we can do, some of that falls away. I mean, uh, you know, I will talk to Republican governor or mayor or member of Congress just about every day about mm. something they want to see in their district. I was, uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, last week, within a few days of each other, I was in uh, um uh, New York and, and Baltimore, two areas where we're improving tunnels that are more than 100 years old that the trains go through that need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And then we were in Louisiana and Texas a few days after that, uh, celebrating what we're doing to uh, replace a bridge in Louisiana and to help the community of Port Arthur in Texas uh, upgrade their port. So there's so many things that we can do that just, whether it's a red state or so-called red state or blue state, whether you got a Republican or, or, or a Democrat, uh, you know, the politics is still there. Uh, but there are ways to get across it in order to get stuff done. And, and that's one of the best parts of, uh, of this job. One of your first crises was during the pandemic when it's a, a, a supply chain shortage affected a whole abundance of American citizens here. What did you learn from that experience and how can we as a country ensure that it doesn't happen again? Talk about that for a second. Yeah, here's what happened. Uh, COVID came. It shut down not just the U.S., but it, it completely shut down uh, factories in China. Then they reopened. And then all of these goods started moving toward America all at once. Meanwhile, uh, a lot of us uh, at home started uh, buying more things. We weren't going to the restaurant, so we were more likely to uh, take that money and, and use it on something else. We weren't True. going to the movies, so we got a bigger TV. We weren't uh, going to the gym, so we got a Peloton. You know, a lot of that was going on. And so we had all this stuff coming all at the same time. The ports uh, were having a hard time keeping up. There were 100 ships waiting their turn in the ports of LA and Long Beach. So what we did was uh, we got together with the ports, with the workers, with the companies, and started working on ways to, uh, to get ahead of these kinds of things. And actually, by the end of 2021, by the end of that, that, that season, I, you remember some of the news stories. People were saying, oh, is Christmas canceled? Are we not going to be able to get anything? By the end of that year, we actually had an all-time record high in retail sales in this country and, and the goods moving through our ports. That's not to spike the ball. Uh, we're actually, I just got a, a, a briefing on this today in my office. We're still working on things to make our supply chains move smoother, but they're, they're definitely in better shape than they were. And then for the long run, you know, this is part of why we're doing things like uh, funding these uh, upgrades to ports. I was down in Tampa, Port Tampa Bay, adding a berth there, there so they can take bigger ships. Uh, I was in Savannah. They created a way to create a kind of a, a pop-up container yard so that they could move containers more quickly if the port wasn't ready to get them onto a ship right away. Mm. Those are the kinds of things that we can do. We can, it's not Republican Democrat stuff. It's just problem solving. And mm. it's a big part of why we're here as a department. Let me transition to the airline industry for just a second here because I fly all the time and and thank the good Lord I wasn't a part of that disaster that took place with Southwest Airlines a couple of months ago. Just watching it on television, it was a very, very uncomfortable watch. I'm wondering how you're feeling about the state of the airline industry right now and some of the things that you can speak to that needs to be, dare I say, overhauled or definitely modified to some degree where the American citizen or the average traveler out there doesn't have to ever endure an yeah. experience like that again because Southwest airlines was considered one of the more reliable airlines right. in terms of how they were on time and things of that nature. You never expected to see the level of delays that we saw. Speak to that for a second, sir, please. Yeah, I've been pushing the airlines really hard on how they treat uh, passengers. And uh, we've been using the tools we have as a department to force them to do better. Uh, we were able to get hundreds of millions of dollars in refunds back to passengers. And uh, the biggest increase last year in enforceable customer service improvements that we've seen in a long time. You can actually go to our website and we put up kind of a dashboard. It's got little green check marks and little red X's. So you can find out, you know, if you do get stuck somewhere, uh, which airlines will get you a meal, which airlines will get you a hotel, which airlines will get you a taxi. And we got them to put it in writing so that if they fail to do that, 
we can actually go in and uh, and there can be a, a fine for that violation, which is how you know there's some teeth in it. Mm-hmm. That's led to a lot of improvements. But uh, what we saw over the holidays, there was this epic winter storm that came, uh, shut down a, a lot of flights, and all of the airlines except one got better. Southwest moved in the opposite direction. All the other airlines recovered their operations within a few days. Southwest completely melted down. And it mm-hmm. turned out a lot of it had to do with systems that, that they should have invested in a long time ago. They couldn't even say where their flight attendants were because their computer systems got overwhelmed mm-hmm. uh, by uh, flight crews trying to say where they were with all the, all the flights getting canceled. So what we've been doing is a process to, first of all, investigate Southwest and, uh, and the way they've taken care of customers and a process to make sure that, that passengers get their money back. So uh, if you go to Southwest, you try to get a refund and it doesn't happen or if they didn't reimburse you for your expenses when they were supposed to, you can tell us and we will follow up on that and we will make them take care of you. You know, the, the 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 thing about it, and it's important to point this out as well, because you said that you didn't like the way passengers were being treated. We'd like specifics because as a traveler, I know I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of people. When you talk about the mistreatment of passengers, can you speak to that, sir, for a quick second? Specifically, what are you alluding to? Well, I'll give you a couple examples. For one thing, my department has rules that require the airlines to give you a refund if they cancel your flight uh, and to uh, accommodate you uh, if you run into a problem. Uh, we have set uh, a record now for the uh, num- the toughest fines that have ever been assessed against airlines because a lot of them weren't doing that or they made it so hard that it was almost impossible. This is worth knowing. If your flight gets canceled and you're not going to take the trip after all, they might say, oh, we'll give you, you know, whatever, we'll give you a thousand miles or a, uh, or, or a coupon. You are, if, if you ask for your money back, they are required to give it to you. Matter of mm. fact, on a credit card, they're required to give it to you within a week, uh, wow. seven wow. business days. And if they don't, uh, you can let us know and we can take action against them for that. So that's an example of something where we can hold the airlines accountable as long as passengers know their rights and know when to come to us when you have a problem. One of the things that I pointed out, I mean, you pointed out $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law passed last year. Obviously, you're overseeing the transportation department. I want to know where will some of that money go to? Can you tell the American citizen that listening to this right now? When we think about it, we say $1.2 trillion. That's obviously a lot of money. Where's it going to specifically? Bridges, roads, what? Where's it going? Yeah, so about half of it is outside of transportation. That's things like broadband internet to make sure every American can get good, affordable, fast internet. Uh, it's uh, lead pipes. Uh, you know, we've still got a lot of pipes that are taking, uh, that, that have lead in them that are taking water to our children. Uh, mm. So using some of that funding to replace all of that, all of those pipes. EPA is buying electric school buses so the kids aren't breathing the fumes from the old diesel school buses. Uh, that, that's uh, the, the half that's outside of my department. Then there's the half that we're working on, the transportation half. And it's everything you just mentioned and more. It is roads, it's bridges, it's airports, it's ports, it's trains, it's transit, you name it, we're working on it. Uh, because what we've seen is over the years in this country, we didn't really keep up. We didn't invest, uh, didn't put enough funding into these things. And so uh, th- that's one of the reasons why I think we finally uh, got bipartisan agreement that it's time to do this. A lot of people have promised it, but uh, President Biden uh, said this had to be a priority when we came in. We got it through Congress in the first year, and now my department's moving that money out to communities. Uh, everything you can think of. Uh, from a better bridge to uh, chargers for electric vehicles, because there are going to be more electric vehicles in the, in the course of this decade. Uh, anything and everything that we need to have the best transportation system in the country. We're speaking to United States Transportation Secretary, Mr. Pete Buttigieg. And if that I pronounce, by the way, did I pronounce your, your name correct? I want to make sure of that. I mean, I listen to you on TV. I listen to people <laughs> talking to you on TV. I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. Buttigieg, correct? You got it. You got it perfectly. Most Thank people you so much. just call me Pete, so I appreciate you getting it right. It's, it's not a problem. I wanted to get it right. Going back to East Palestine, Ohio, the derailment there, you know, uh, uh, people have been talking about water contamination, air contamination. There's obviously profound concern where that takes place. What specifically is being done right now to alleviate that concern for the immediate moment? Because you've got residents there that are obviously incredibly concerned. And we've seen politicians all over the airwaves complaining and expressing an elevated level of concern right. about it. Right. I mean, uh, imagine if this happened in your community. Uh, yeah. you, uh, you look out your window and there's a big cloud of toxic smoke outside of, of your home. So people are asking, is the air safe? Is the water safe? Is the soil safe? From day one, uh, this administration's had the EPA on the ground and they've been working with uh, the state, working with the governor, 
uh, working with local first responders and officials too. The biggest thing people need is accurate information and then support for any cleanup that has to take place. So far, uh, the city water has been tested and found to be safe. The air has been tested and found to be safe, but there's got to be long-term testing. Uh, keep checking the soil, make sure that it's okay. Uh, keep checking the areas where we do know that, that uh, these chemicals went into the water. Uh, keep checking on uh, uh, everything that could affect somebody's health. And that's exactly what, uh, what the, the administration's been doing. You've you got folks who are just going about their lives. They want to know that their community and their home uh, and their school and their workplace is going to be safe. And there's one other thing that's really important, which is the EPA administrator is requiring Norfolk Southern, that's the uh, railroad company, the freight railroad company whose train this was, to pay for the cleanup. Uh, because it's definitely not uh, something that should fall on the residents who, who are experiencing all of this through no fault of their own. Mm. You know, uh, it's been in the news that you, you failed to visit the, the the site. I don't know whether that's true or not at the moment that we're talking right now. Have you been uh, to the derailment site? And if not, why not? So as you and I speak, I'm about to go. Probably by the time this podcast airs, I will have already been there. Uh, I have been following the norm, which is usually somebody with my job, the transportation secretary, tries to stay out of the way for the first few days of the National Transportation Safety Board. I don't want to get too much into the bureaucracy. Sure. The NTSB, which investigates crashes uh, from airplane crashes to trail, train derailments, any big uh, incident like this, they're completely independent from my department. And the reason of that uh, is that they do their investigation, sometimes with our help, but they own that, that primary safety investigation so that then they can circle back and make recommendations on things that should change, including sometimes recommendations to me about things we should be doing differently. So I respect their independence, but I do consider it important to be on the ground. Uh, I, I was a mayor of my community, uh, always wanted to be uh, out where there was an issue. And uh, at the same time, you know, when I was a mayor and we saw those disaster responses, you would see a lot of people come in uh, just because they wanted to look good. When I'm there, it'll be about action. It'll be about getting work done. And uh, I, that, that's what the community really deserves. You're a former mayor. You're a former presidential candidate. I'm wondering, um, as you look at this job right now and all that it entails, there were people who were wondering about your qualifications for the job. There are people that are still wondering whether or not you're going to run for president again sometime in the near future. What do you want people to know about Pete Buttigieg as, a, as it pertains to his aspirations for higher office or how you feel about working in your present job? Can you talk to us about that for a second, just for those out there who may be curious as about as it pertains to what your goals are beyond, obviously, this yeah. this particular job right now? Well, I'm very focused on the job right now because it's, it's so important and it's such an important time for transportation. We're dealing with huge challenges from the supply chain issues to uh, safety issues like this ra rail derailment to uh, uh, what's going on in uh, uh, in aviation and, and getting the airlines to step up their practices to a very serious issue around the country doesn't get talked about enough, uh, which is uh, roadway deaths and car crashes. We're so used to it that we act like it's normal. 40,000 people a year die in our car crashes, and it, it's on par with, uh, uh, with gun violence, and we're working to fight that. Uh, so we're dealing with those important, heavy, meaningful issues and uh, also a really exciting time to be building infrastructure for the future. One of the reasons I think this is the best job in the, in the federal government right now is that we are building our transportation infrastructure to compete and to win uh, as a country against uh, all of our competitors around the world, uh, having better trains, having better airports, setting up our roads and bridges. So uh, this is a job, it's, it's, it's incredibly demanding, but I, I love this job. Uh, in terms of qualifications, yeah, I, I compare my uh, background in transportation to others who have had this job. Uh, I worked a lot on transportation when I was the mayor of my hometown and was uh, really honored by, uh, by some of the recognition we got, it, actually including uh, an award from the Department of Transportation that I now lead. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm focused on making sure that we get this department working for the future. And uh, you know, past that, uh, I don't know what the future holds, but I, I know that we have a chance right now to build things and fix things that my kids and my kids' kids will be counting on, just the way right now uh, we, we take trains through tunnels and we drive on roads that were built by our, our grandparents' generation and the generation before that. Indulge my curiosity here. You're a parent. You have a husband. You've been openly gay. Uh, it, when you were running for office, you spoke about a plethora of issues. You talked about 
gay bashing. We talked about gun control. We talked about a whole host of things. And then I'm looking at things right now. You've got the Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' controversial don't say gay bill. You've got that going on. We all, we got gun violence, you know, just, just sifting through this nation like a virus as far as I'm concerned at this particular moment in time. I'm incredibly alarmed by that. I want to know how difficult it is for you, sir. As great as your job may be, and as you are articulated, you're familiar with it because you were involved in transportation when you were the mayor. But obviously, being the transportation secretary, you're dealing with these issues as opposed to some of the other issues that I just mentioned, at least one would surmise that. How mm-hmm. difficult is it for you to be separated from these issues to some degree, knowing that you ran for the highest office in the land, the presidency of the United States, where all of these issues would have been relevant and pertinent to the job if you had if you had captured the presidency to be in the transportation secretary and se- and essentially confined to the issues involving transportation, how challenging is that for you, if at all? You know, one of the things I found is is so many of the things I care about are things that we can improve or work on, specifically by working on transportation, uh, including some of the biggest issues we talked about back when I was running for president. Uh, you know, when we talk about having an economy that works for everybody. A lot of that's making sure that we keep building good infrastructure in ways that create jobs and making sure that everybody has a shot at the good paying jobs. We talk about big global issues like uh, like climate and the environment, Uh, you know, having uh, good transit systems and and, and clean transportation. is a big part of how we have a better climate and environment. Even when we talk about issues like uh, like racial justice, uh, making sure that uh, the way that infrastructure is built serves communities, connects them, uh, doesn't divide them. And, And again, that it's fair, that everybody gets a fair shot. Those are things we get to work on here. Uh, Safety. But there are so many different things that matter in this job uh, that it it, it takes more than all of the energy that I've got. And then I go home and I try to be a good husband and I try to be a good dad. Uh, I've got a a son and a daughter. They're uh, twins. They're 18 months old. Mm. Uh, And uh, I just think a lot about how I can make the world better for them or try to do my part uh, as a citizen and and, and as a public servant to, to make this a better world for them. What do you think your chances are of pulling that off considering the times that we're living in? I got to admit to you, I don't think I've ever seen it. I'm 55 years old. I don't think I've ever seen it as bad as it's been throughout the streets of America at this particular moment in time. People don't want to listen to one another. They're more divisive than ever before. Uh, people don't want to seem to come together as much as we used to be committed to such things. What do you think the chances are of you contributing and being able to pull off us reaching better times? You know, I told you about some of the best parts of this job. Uh, probably the worst part of the job is, is the negativity. And there is a lot of that. There's a lot of darkness out there. There's a lot of, of division. There's a lot of uh, negativity. But uh, I find that there are ways to, to get through all of that. And, and that's especially true when we bring real improvements to communities that have needed them for a long time. Uh, when, when I'm able to, to uh, come to a community that has been wanting for years and years to get a uh, a bridge fixed or get, get their tunnel repaired or, or uh, just get some good paying jobs in, in that community. And I'm there uh, not just with words, but with funding saying, OK, you know, we're here to help uh, because of the president's uh, uh, infrastructure law and the funding that we got. It's just one example of something that gives me hope. Uh, and, and I think you have to find sources of hope to do any kind of difficult job, but especially in public service, especially in, in, in government, and public life. Uh, you got to find the things that make you the most hopeful and, and, and lean on them. Uh, when there's a, a dark moment that, uh, uh, that, that threatens to, uh, to, to drain your energy away. And, and mm-hmm. those moments come often uh, mm-hmm. here in, in Washington. Last couple of questions for you. You're a veteran of the war in Afghanistan, if I remember correctly, just reading from my notes here. Right. Um, and, and I know the PACT Act is a new law that expands uh, VA health care benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, or Agent Orange and other toxic substances, substances. But you've been working. You've been doing some work with the PACT Act. Could you speak to that for a second, please? Yeah, this is, uh, I think, one of the best things to happen uh, in, in this administration. And um, I'm, I'm proud to be part of an administration that saw this through. So many people, especially my generation of people who served in Afghanistan and in Iraq, were exposed to, uh, to burn pits. This is where in order to get, uh, get rid of things uh, you know, on a base that didn't have uh, a good way to dispose of hazardous waste, that didn't, didn't even have normal trash uh, pickup services, they just burn a lot of stuff. And that went into the air. And that's giving a lot of people uh, health issues that they're struggling through right now, cancer, uh, other, other ailments that come with having been exposed to all of that during, during deployment. And uh, for a long time, uh, people who had that kind of injury didn't get the same help at the VA that you would get if you had some of the other injuries of war that, that people understood. 
uh, we're getting better. We've got a long way to go, but we're getting better at a country at finally taking care of all of the things that ha can happen to our veterans. And yes, that could mean a, a physical injury, but it could also mean uh, an injury to your mental health. Uh, it could mean an injury that doesn't show up on day one, like what happens with these burn pits. And the PACT Act is legislation that, that helps make sure that those veterans can get that care. And, uh, you know, I think about uh, the, the deployment to Afghanistan that, that I had shaped me in, in so many ways and, uh, and changed my life. Uh, a lot of the, the guys I was out there with, they went back four, five, six more times. Uh, they deserve to be taken care of. And that's what this legislation does. Mm. Any plans for running for higher officer? I'd be remiss and neglecting to ask that question yet again before I let you get on out of here. Any <laughs> Thanks, plans of that? You, 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 you did it before in 2020. Any plans on going forward again? Anytime right in the now, near future? I, I don't know what the future holds, but I know that right now I'm, I'm, I'm 100% focused on this job and I'm not looking for or running for any other. How worried are you that President Biden, a lot of people bring up his age, fair or unfair, he'll be 82 when he's running for re-election. If he wins, he'll be in office until he's 86 years of age. Uh, that seems to be a legitimate concern by a lot of people. What about people within his administration like yourself? Let me tell you, uh, this president back on the campaign and definitely now as president, one thing I see time and time again is how he is underestimated. I mean, look at what's been achieved uh, just in the last couple of years. The, the, the most significant economic plan since, the, since FDR was president. Uh, the, the most significant infrastructure improvements since the Eisenhower years. Uh, by the way, while dealing with the biggest land war in Europe uh, since, uh, uh, since the, the Truman administration, uh, the biggest climate bill ever, uh, getting us through the worst health care crisis uh, or, or public health crisis in 100 years. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, it's about results. And, uh, uh, you know, back when I was a very young candidate for president, I made the case that uh, uh, your age was less important than your vision uh, and your results. I would say the same uh, uh, in terms of the reason I'm proud uh, uh, to be part of a cabinet, to be part of this president, uh, this president's leadership and administration, watching what he has been able to get done. And I think in the end, what matters most about, about any leader is their ability to get delivered. Uh, to, to deliver and to get results and on issue after issue, especially, you know, this infrastructure. The last administration talked about infrastructure all the time. They never actually did it. Uh, this president did. And uh, I, I think at the end of the day, that's the most important thing to think about in sizing up the leadership that, that he's offered this country. United States Transportation Secretary, the one and only Pete Buttigieg. Honored to have you on the show, sir. Thank you so much for joining No Mercy. Really appreciate your time. All the best to you. Same here. Appreciate you having me on. Good talking with you. The NBA season is underway, and I got to tell you, all I hear from my friends, my family, my colleagues, is how much more fun it is when you're betting on the action. So it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in free bets if your first bet doesn't win. If it doesn't win, maybe it will. You never know. You can bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to player props to same game parlays. How many points or boards is LeBron James going to have? Bet on it and find out. You can even bet live with updated odds. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. So download FanDuel today using promo code MERCY to get your no sweat. First bet up to $1,000. Make every moment more this season with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. 21 plus in select states. First online real money wager only. Bonus issued as is non-withdrawable free bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Virginia, and West Virginia. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text NEXTSTEP to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming and Kansas or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope ny in New York. Tennessee redline 1-800-889-9789 in Tennessee. If you've ever needed to buy wine for a get-together, or a fancy dinner, or a house party, you might have felt a little intimidated. I don't often feel intimidated. I mean, you know me. But when there are hundreds and hundreds of different bottles and grapes and varieties to choose from, even your boy Stephen A. Smith can get a little rattled. That's why you need First Leaf. They're America's most personalized wine company. And all you need to do is take their short taste quiz and rate a few wines before you get a customized selection of award-winning wines based on your taste. Their process is 96% accurate. They really don't miss. And you'll save money compared to what you pay at a wine store. It's delivered right to your door whenever you
you choose. This is how you buy wine, ladies and gentlemen. Sign up today and you'll get your first six bottles for $39.95 plus free shipping. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash mercy. That's T-R-Y-F-I-R-S-T-L-E-A-F dot com slash mercy to get your first six bottles for $39.95 plus free shipping. Tryfirstleaf.com slash mercy. Thanks again to the Transportation Secretary for the United States of America, Mr. Pete Buttigieg. What you can say is that he answered all the questions. What happened? We learned what happened. What's being done about it? We've learned that, according to him. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the aficionados out there who are enlightened and in tune about what actually happens with transportation, what's supposed to happen compared to what is happening, can dissect what he said. My goal in interviewing him was to ask the questions, whether it's Southwest Airlines, whether it was the supply chain shortage during the pandemic, whether it's the train derailment that just took place February 3rd. How did that happen and what's being done to alleviate it and also protect the American citizens who were forced to evacuate from East Palestine, Ohio, who's got contaminated water and air to deal with? It's to ask those questions, to hear his answers, and for you to dissect the truth and veracity of it all, or lack thereof. It's not my lane. I can interview anybody and ask them questions, but I don't know all the damn answers to those questions. It's his job. And those close to the situation, in positions where they'd have direct knowledge as to whether or not to decipher what he's saying is true or false. That's all I tried to do. I will tell you what I was interested in. You saw I asked him when he talked about we've had problems with the airlines in terms of their treatment of customers. You heard me follow up on that. What problems? What are you talking about? What are you alluded to? All right, what's going to be done to alleviate that? Come to find out, you can get a refund inside of a week. They're obligated to give it to you. They can't come to you with points. Well, here's some additional points. Or you could get this hotel room or whatever the case may be. They got to get you a refund within a week. I like that. That's something I didn't know because I'm a traveler. I had no knowledge of that whatsoever. I also think it's important to really, really highlight what he talked about because I thought one of my first questions is, what's your job description? What does your job entail exactly? The office of the secretary formulates national transportation policy, prepares needed transportation legislation, helps negotiate and implement international transportation agreements assures the fitness of U.S. airlines and enforces airline consumer protection regulations. I think those things are important. I think those things matter. I didn't expect them to acknowledge that he's planning on running for office in the foreseeable future. After all, he's working for a man who plans to run for re-election in Joe Biden, despite the fact he's going to be 82 years old. Come 2024. He alluded to the deregulation that took place under the Trump administration as it pertained to the railroad industry. How true that is, don't know. Y'all can look that up and find out. But I do thank him for taking time to come on and explain. Because I think it's important. Especially when you consider the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law passed last year, which he now is oversee. It's one of the most significant investments in America's bridges, roads, and rails in more than a half century. These are according to the reports. He talked to you about what they're going to do about it. Right now, the order today is to get down to East Palestine, Ohio, which he said he was heading towards. And as a result, see what he can do to alleviate that situation on a personal level because he clearly has the power to make things happen. That's all I can tell you. You've heard what he's had to say. Listen and judge for yourself. What I will say is this. The challenge that I believe he has is that he didn't deny the fact that the criticism, the quote unquote noise is emanating from both sides. It's not just Senator Schmidt. It's not just Senator Rubio on the Republican side. There were also Democrats that were critical of what's transpiring since the derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. 
They expected things to be handled a bit more expeditiously and more thoroughly. And they've got questions about that right now because we've got American citizens that are scared to death. You've got some people out there saying they're sick. You've got elected officials out there imploring, not just encouraging, imploring people not to even drink the damn water or to get the hell out of town so you're not breathing the same air. That's bad. That has to be alleviated. Again, I aspire to talk about more lighthearted things, sports, pop culture, and entertainment and things of that nature. But when things of this magnitude transpire, you have to broach it because it's not prejudice. It's not about race. It's not about gender. It's not about age. It's about human life. And then some. Because if humans can't drink the water or breathe the air, I surmise animals can't either. We have to think about all of that and recognize the fact that when things transpire that highlight and illuminate for you that there are certain things in life that are more important than yourself, they extend beyond you. We have to embrace that with a level of fervent compassion that's necessary just to support and ensure that our fellow man and woman is being looked out for. That's why I did that interview. Pete Buttigieg. And I hope you can appreciate where I was coming from. I'm going to get on out of here. Thank you for listening. And just the latest reminder that you don't have to know sports to know mercy. Until next time, everybody, peace and love. 